Eros and Civilization, a Philosophical Inquiry into Freud by Herbert Marcuse. This is Chapter 9, The Aesthetic Dimension. Obviously, the aesthetic dimension cannot validate a reality principle. Like imagination, which is its constitutive mental faculty, the realm of aesthetics is essentially unrealistic. It has retained its freedom from the reality principle at the price of being ineffective in the reality. Aesthetic values may function in life for cultural adornment and, and elevation or as private hobbies, but to live with these values is the privilege of geniuses or the mark of decadent bohemians. Before the court of theoretical and practical reason, which have shaped the world of the performance principle, the aesthetic existence stands condemned. However, we shall try to show that this notion of aesthetics results from a cultural repression of contents and truths that are inimical to the performance principle. We shall attempt to undo this repression theoretically by recalling the original meaning and function of aesthetic. This task involves the demonstration of the interconnection between pleasure, sensuousness, beauty, truth, art, and freedom a connection revealed in the philosophical history of the term aesthetic. There, the term aims at a realm which preserves the truth of the senses and reconciles in the reality of freedom, the lower and the higher faculties of man, sensuousness and intellect, pleasure and reason. We shall confine the discussion to the period in which the meaning of the term aesthetic was fixed, the second half of the 18th century. In Kant's philosophy, the basic antagonism between subject and object is reflected in the dichotomy between the mental faculties, sensuousness and intellect, understanding, desire and cognition, practical and theoretical reason. Practical reason constitutes freedom under self-given moral laws for moral ends. Theoretical reason constitutes nature under the laws of causality. The realm of nature is totally different from the realm of freedom. No subjective autonomy can break into the laws of causality. And no sense datum can determine the autonomy of the subject, for otherwise the subject would not be free. Still, the autonomy of the subject is to have an effect in the objective reality, and the ends that the subject sets for itself must be real. Thus, the realm of nature must be susceptible to the legislation of freedom. An intermediary dimension must exist in which the two meet. A third faculty must mediate between theoretical and practical reason, a faculty that brings about a transition from the realm of nature to the realm of freedom and links together the lower and higher faculties, those of desire and those of knowledge. This third faculty is that of judgment, a tripartite division of the mind underlies the initial dichotomy. While theoretical reason, understanding, provides the a priori principles of cognition and practical reason those of desire, will, the faculty of judgment mediates between these two by virtue of the feeling of pain and pleasure. Combined with the feeling of pleasure, judgment is aesthetic and its field of application is art. This, in crude abbreviation, is Kant's classical de derivation of the aesthetic function in his introduction to the critique of judgment. The obscurity of his exposition is caused largely by the fact that it, that it merges the original meaning of aesthetic pertaining to the senses with the new connotation pertaining to beauty, especially art, which had definitely triumphed during Kant's own period. Although his effort to recapture the unrepressed content exhausts itself within the rigid limits set by his transcendental method, his conception still furnishes the best guidance for understanding the full scope of the aesthetic dimension. In the critique of judgment, the aesthetic dimension and the corresponding feeling of pleasure emerge not merely as a third dimension and faculty of the mind, but as its center. The medium through which nature becomes susceptible to freedom, necessity to autonomy. In this mediation, the aesthetic function is a symbolic one. The famous paragraph 59 of the critique is entitled, Of Beauty as the Symbol of Morality. In Kant's system, morality is the 
realm of freedom, in which practical reason realizes itself under self-given laws. Beauty symbolizes this realm insofar as it demonstrates intuitively the reality of freedom. Since freedom is an idea to which no sense perception can correspond, such demonstration can only be indirect, symbolical, per analogium. We shall presently try to elucidate the ground for this strange analogy, which is at the same time the ground on which the aesthetic functions, our function links the lower faculties of sensuousness to morality. Before doing so, we wish to recall the context in which the problem of aesthetics became acute. Our def definition of the specific historical character of the established reality principle led to a re-examination of what Freud considered to be its universal validity. We questioned this validity in view of the historical possibility of the abolition of the repressive controls imposed by civilization. The very achievements of this civilization seemed to make the performance principle obsolete to make the repressive utilization of the instincts archaic. But the idea of a non-repressive civilization on the basis of the achievements of the performance principle encountered the argument that instinctual liberation and consequently total liberation would explode civilization itself, since the latter is sustained only through renunciation and work, labor. In other words, through the repressive utilization of instinctual energy. Freed from these constraints, man would exist without work and without order. He would fall back into nature, which would destroy culture. To meet this argument, we recalled certain archetypes of imagination, which, in contrast to the culture heroes of repressive productivity, symbolized creative receptivity. These archetypes envisioned the fulfillment of man and nature, not through domination and exploitation, but through release of inherent libidinal forces. We then set ourselves the task of verifying these symbols, that is to say, demonstrating their true truth value as symbols of a reality principle beyond the performance principle. We thought that the representative content of the Orphic and narcissistic images was the erotic reconciliation, union of man and nature in the aesthetic attitude, where order is beauty and work is play. The next step the next step was to eliminate the distortion of the aesthetic attitude into the unreal atmosphere of the museum or of Bohemia. With this purpose in mind, we tried to recapture the full content of the aesthetic dimension by looking for its philosophical legitimation. We found that in Kant's philosophy, the aesthetic dimension occupies the central position between sensuousness and morality, the two poles of the human existence. If this is the case, then the aesthetic dimension must contain principles valid for both, both realms. The basic experience in this dimension is sensuous rather than conceptual. The aesthetic perception is essentially intuition, not notion. The nature of sensuousness is receptivity, cognition through being affected by given objects. It is by virtue of its intrinsic relation to sensuousness that the aesthetic function assumes its central position. The aesthetic perception is accompanied by pleasure. This pleasure derives from the perception of the pure form of an object, regardless, regardless of its matter and of its internal or external purpose. An object represented in its pure form is beautiful. Such representation is the work or rather the play of imagination. As imagination, the aesthetic perception is both sensuousness and at the same time more than sensuousness, the third basic faculty. It gives pleasure and is therefore essentially subjective. But insofar as this pleasure is constituted by the pure form of the object itself, it accompanies the aesthetic perception universally and necessarily for any perceiving subject. Although sensuous and therefore receptive, the aesthetic imagination is creative. In a free synthesis of its own, it constitutes beauty. In the aesthetic imagination, sensuousness generates universally valid principles for an objective order. The two main categories defining this order are purpose, purposiveness without purpose and lawfulness without law. The circumscribe they circumscribe, beyond the Kantian context, the essence of a truly non-repressive order. The first defines the structure of beauty, the second that of freedom, 
Their common character is gratification in the free play of the released potentialities of man and nature. Kant develops these categories only as processes of the mind, but the impact of his theory on his contemporaries went far beyond the frontiers established by his transcendental philosophy. A few years after the publication of the Critique of Judgment, Schiller derived from Kant's conception the notion of a new mode of civilization. To Kant, purpose, purposiveness without purpose, formal purpo purposiveness, is the form in which the object appears in the aesthetic representation. Whatever the object may be, thing or flower, animal or, or man, it is represented and judged not in terms of its usefulness, not according to any purpose it may possibly serve, and also not in view of its internal finality and completeness. In the aesthetic imagination, the object is rather represented as free from all such relations and properties, as freely being itself. The experience in which the object is thus given is totally different from the everyday, as well as scientific experience. All links between the object and the world of theoretical and practical reason are severed, or rather suspended. This experience, which releases the object into its free being, is the work of the free play of imagination. Subject and object become free in a new sense. From this radical change in the attitude toward being results a new quality of pleasure generated by the form in which the object now reveals itself. Its pure form suggests a unity of the manifold, an accord of movements and relations which operates under its own laws, the pure manifestation of its being there, its existence. This is the manifestation of beauty. Imagination comes into accord with the cognitive notions of understanding, and this accord establishes a harmony of the mental faculties, which is the pleasurable response to the free harmony of the aesthetic object. The order, the order of beauty results from the order which governs the play of imagination. This double order is in conformity with laws, but laws that are themselves free. They are not superimposed and they do not enforce the attainment of specific ends and purposes. They are the pure form of, ex of existence itself. The aesthetic conformity to law links nature and freedom, pleasure and morality. The aesthetic judgment is, in respect of the feeling of pleasure or pain, a constitutive principle. The spontaneity in the play of the cognitive faculties, the harmony of which contains the ground of this pleasure, makes the concept of the purposive purposiveness of nature, the mediating link between the conceptual realm of nature and that of freedom. Whilst at the same time, this spontaneity promotes the susceptibility of the, mind, of the mind to moral feeling. To Kant, the aesthetic, the aesthetic dimension is the medium in which the senses and the intellect meet. The mediation is accomplished by imagination, which is the third mental faculty. Moreover, the aesthetic dimension is also the medium in which nature and freedom meet. This twofold mediation is necessitated by the pervasive conflict between the lower and the higher faculties of man, generated by the, pro the progress of civilization, progress achieved through the subjugation of the sensuous faculties to reason and through the repressive utilization for social needs. The philosophical effort to mediate in the aesthetic dimension between sensuousness and reason thus appears as an attempt to reconcile the two spheres of the human existence which were torn asunder by a repressive reality principle. The mediating function is performed by the aesthetic faculty, which is akin to sensuousness pertaining to the senses. Consequently, the aesthetic reconciliation implies strengthening sensuousness as against the tyranny of reason, and ultimately even calls for the liberation of sensuousness from the repressive domination of reason. Indeed, when, on the basis of Kant's theory, the aesthetic function becomes the central theme of the philosophy of culture, it is used to demonstrate the principles of a non-repressive civilization, in which reason is sensuous and sensuousness rational. Schiller's Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Man, from 1795, written largely under the impact of the critique of judgment, aim at remaking of civilization by virtue of the liberating force of the aesthetic function.
it is envisaged as containing the possibility of a new reality principle. The inner logic of the tradition of Western thought impelled Schiller to define the new reality principle and the new experience corresponding to it as aesthetic. We have emphasized the term originally designated pertaining to the senses with stress on their cognitive function. Under the predominance of rationalism, the cognitive function of sensuousness has been constantly minimized. In line with the repressive concept of reason, con cognition became the ultimate concern of the higher, non-sensuous faculties of the mind. Aesthetics were absorbed by logic and metaphysics. Sensuousness, as the lower and even lowest faculty, furnished at best the mere stuff, the raw material for cognition, to be organized by the higher faculties of the intellect. The content and validity of the aesthetic function were whittled down. Sensuousness retained a measure of philosophical dignity in a subordinate epistemological position. Those of its processes that did not fit into the rationalistic epistemo epistemology, that is, those that went beyond the passive perception of data, became homeless. Foremost among these homeless contents and values were those of imagination, free, creative, or reproductive intuition of objects which are not directly given, the faculty to represent objects without their being present. There was no aesthetics as the science of sensuousness to correspond to logic as the science of conceptual understanding. But around the middle of the 18th century, aesthetics appeared as a new philosophical discipline, as the theory of beauty and art. Alexander Baumgarten established the term and its modern usage. The change in meaning from pertaining to the senses to pertaining to beauty and art is a far deeper significance than an academic innovation. The philosophical history of the term aesthetic reflects the repressive treatment of the sensuous and thereby corporal cognitive processes. In this history, the foundation of aesthetics as an independent discipline counteracts the repressive rule of reason. The efforts to demonstrate the central position of the aesthetic function and to establish it as an ex existential category invoke the inherent truth values of the senses against their deprivation under the prevailing reality principle. The discipline of aesthetics installs the order of sensuousness as against the order of reason. Introdu introduced into the philosophy of culture, this notion aims at a liberation of the senses which, far from destroying civilization, would give it a firmer basis and would greatly enhance its potentialities. Operating through a basic impulse, namely the play impulse, the aesthetic function would abolish compulsion and place man both morally and physically in freedom. It would harmonize the feelings and affections with the ideas of reason, deprive the laws of reason of their moral compulsion, and reconcile them with the interests of the senses. It will be objected that this interpretation, which connects the philosophical term sensuousness as a cognitive mental faculty, with liberation of the senses, is a mere play on an etymological ambiguity. The root sense in sensuousness no longer justifies the connotation of sensuality. In German, sensuousness and sensuality are still rendered by one and the same term, sinlich, sinlichkeit. It connotes an instinctual, especially sexual, gratification, as well as cognitive sense perceptiveness and representation, sensation. This double connotation is preserved in every day as well as philosophical language and is retained in the use of the term sinlichkeit for the foundation of aesthetics. Here, the term designates the lower, opaque, confused, cognitive faculties of man plus the feeling of pain and pleasure, sensations plus affections. In Schiller's Letters on the Aesthetic Education, the stress is on the impulsive, instinctual character of the aesthetic function. This content provides the basic material for the new discipline of aesthetics. The latter is conceived as the science of sensitive cognition, a logic of the lower cognitive faculties. Aesthetics is the sister, and at the same time the counterpart to logic. The opposition to the predominance of reason characterizes the new science, 
not reason but sensuousness, is constitutive of aesthetic truth or falsehood. What sensuousness recognizes or can recognize as true, aesthetics can represent as true even if reason rejects it as untrue. And Kant stated in his lectures on anthropology, one can establish one can establish universal laws of sensuousness just as one can establish universal laws of understanding, i.e. there is a science of sensuousness, namely aesthetics, and a science of understand understanding, namely logic. The principles and truths of sensuousness supply the content of aesthetics, and the objective and purpose of aesthetics is the perfection of sen sensitive cognition. This perfection is beauty. Here the step is made that transforms aesthetics, the science of sensuousness, into the science of art, and, and the order of sensuousness into the order of art. The etymological fate of a basic term is rarely an accident. What is the reality behind the conceptual development from sensuality to sensuousness, sensitive cognition to art, aesthetics? Sensuousness, the mediating concept, designates the senses as sources and organs of cognition. But the senses are not exclusively, and not even primarily, organs of cognition. Their cognitive function is confused with their appetitive function. Sensuality. They are erotogenic, and they are governed by the pleasure principle. From this fusion of the cognitive and appetitive functions derives the confused, inferior, passive character of sense cognition, which makes it unsuitable for the reality principle, unless subjected to and formed by the conceptual activity of the intellect, of reason, and in and insofar as philosophy accepted the rules and values of the reality principle, the claim of sensuousness free from the dominance of reason found no place in philosophy greatly modified, it obtained refuge in the theory of art. The truth of art is the liberation of sensuousness through its reconciliation with reason. This is the central notion of classical idealistic aesthetics. In art, thought is materialized and matter is not extraneously determined by thought, but is itself free insofar as the natural sensuous affectional possess their measure, purpose and harmony in themselves. While perception and feeling are raised to the universality of the spirit, thought not only renounces its hostility against nature, but enjoys itself in nature. Feeling, joy, and pleasure are sanctioned and justified so that nature and freedom, sensuousness and reason, find in their unity their right and their gratification. Art challenges the prevailing principle of reason. In representing the order of sensuousness, it invokes a tabooed logic the logic of gratification is against that of repression. Behind the sublimated aesthetic form, the unsublimated content shows forth the commitment of art to the pleasure principle. The investigation of the erotic roots of art plays a large role in psychoanalysis. However, these roots are in the work and function of art rather than in the artist. The aesthetic form is sensuous form, constituted by the order of sensuousness. If the perfection of sense cognition is defined as beauty, this, this definition still retains the inner connection with instinctual gratification and aesthetic pleasure is still pleasure. But the sensual origin is repressed and the gratification is in the pure form of the object. As aesthetic value, the non-conceptual truth of the senses is sanctioned and freedom from the reality principle is granted to the free play of creative imagination. Here, a reality with quite different standards is recognized. However, since this other free reality is attributed to art and its experience to the aesthetic attitude, it is non-committing and does not engage the human existence in the ordinary way of life. It is unreal. Schiller's attempt to undo the sublimation of the aesthetic function starts from Kant's position. Only because imagination is a central faculty of the mind only because beauty is a necessary condition of humanity can the aesthetic function play a decisive role in reshaping civilization. When Schiller wrote, the need for such a reshaping seemed obvious. Herder and Schiller, Hegel and novelists, 
developed in almost identical terms the concept of alienation. As industrial society begins to take shape under the rule of the performance principle, its inherent negativity permeates the philosophical analysis. Enjoyment is separated from labor, the means from the end exertion from recompense. Eternally fettered only to a single little fragment of the whole, man fashions himself only as a fragment. Ever hearing only the monotonous whirl of the wheel which he turns, he never develops the harmony of his being, and instead of shaping the humanity that lies in his nature, he becomes a mere imprint of his occupation, his science. Since it was civilization itself which dealt modern man this wound, only a new mode of civilization can heal it. The wound is caused by the antagonistic relation between the two polar dimensions of the human existence. Schiller describes this antagonism in a series of paired concepts, sensuousness and reason, matter and form, spirit, nature and freedom, the particular and the universal. Each of the two dimensions is governed by a basic impulse, the sensuous impulse and the form impulse. The former is essentially passive, receptive, the latter active, mastering, domineering. Culture is built by the combination and interaction of these two impulses. But in the established civilization, their, realize, their relation has been an antagonistic one. Instead of reconciling both impulses by making sensuousness rational and reason sensuous, civilization has subjugated sensuousness to reason in such a manner that the former, if it reasserts itself, does so in destructive and savage forms, while the tyranny of reason impoverishes and barbarizes sensuousness. The conflict must be resolved if human potentialities are to realize themselves freely. Since only the impulses have the lasting force that fundamentally affects the human existence, such reconciliation between the two impulses must be the work of a third impulse. Schiller defines this third mediating impulse as the play impulse, its objective as beauty and its goal as freedom. We shall presently try to rescue the full content of Schiller's notion from the, from the benevolent aesthetic treatment to which the traditional interpretation has confined it. The quest is for the solution of a political problem, the liberation of man from inhuman existential conditions. Schiller states that in order to solve the political problem, one must pass through the aesthetic since it is beauty that leads to freedom. The play impulse is the vehicle of this liberation. The impulse does not aim at playing with something, rather it is the play of life itself, beyond want and external compulsion. The manifestation of an existence without fear and anxiety, and thus the manifestation of freedom itself. Man is free only where he is free from constraint, external and internal, physical and moral, when he is constrained neither by law or nor by need. But such constraint is the reality. Freedom is thus, in a strict sense, freedom from the established reality. Man is free when the reality loses its seriousness, and when its necessity becomes light. The greatest stupidity and the greatest intelligence have a certain affinity with each other in that they both seek only the real, However, such need for and attachment to the real are merely the results of want. In contrast, indifference to reality and interest in show are the tokens of freedom from want and a true enlargement of humanity. In a genuinely humane civilization, the human existence will be play rather than toil, and man will live in display rather than need. These ideas represent one of the most advanced positions of thought. It must be understood that, liber that the liberation from the reality which is here envisaged is not transcendental, inner, or merely intellectual freedom, as Schiller explicitly emphasizes, but freedom in the reality. The reality that loses its seriousness is the inhumane reality of want and need, and it loses its seriousness when wants and needs can be satisfied without alienated labor. Then man is free to play with his faculties and potentialities and with those of nature, and only by playing with them is he free. His world is then display, 
and its order is that of beauty. Because it is the realization of freedom, play is more than the constraining physical and moral reality. Man is only serious with the agreeable, the good, the perfect, but with beauty he plays. Such formulations would be irresponsible aestheticism if the realm of play were one of ornament, luxury, holiday, in an otherwise repressive world. But here the aesthetic function is conceived as a principle governing the entire human existence, and it can do so only if it becomes universal. Oops. Aesthetic culture presupposes a total revolution in the mode of perception and feeling, and such revolution becomes possible only if civilization has reached the highest physical and intellectual maturity. Only when the constraint of need is replaced by the constraint of superfluity, abundance, will the human existence be impelled to a free movement which is itself both end and means. Liberated from the pressure of painful purposes and performances necessitated by want, man will be restored into the freedom to be what he ought to be. But what ought to be will be freedom itself, the freedom to play. The mental faculty exercising this freedom is that of imagination. It traces and projects the potentialities of all being. Liberated from their enslavement by constraining matter, they appear as pure forms. As such, they constitute an order of their own. They exist according to the laws of beauty. Once it has really gained ascendancy as a principle of civilization, the play impulse would literally transform the reality. Nature, the objective world, would then be experienced primarily neither as dominating man as in primitive society, nor as being dominated by man as in the established civilization, but rather as an object of, com of contemplation. With this change in the basic and formative experience, the object of experience itself changes, released from violent domination and exploitation, and instead shaped by the play impulse, nature would also be liberated from its own brutality and would become free to display the wealth of its purposeless forms which express the inner life of its objects. And a corresponding change would take place in the subjective world. Here too, the aesthetic experience would arrest the violent and exploitative productivity which made man into an instrument of labor. But he would not be returned to a state of suffering passivity. His existence would still be activity, but what he possesses and produces need bear no longer the traces of servitude, the fearful design of its purpose. Beyond want and anxiety, human activity becomes display, the free manifestation of potentialities. At this point, the explosive quality of Schiller's conception comes into focus. He had diagnosed the disease of civilization as the conflict between the two basic impulses of man, the sensuous and the form impulses, or rather as the violent solution of this conflict, the establishment of the repressive tyranny of reason over sensuousness. Consequently, the reconciliation of the conflicting impulses would involve the removal of this tyranny, that is, the restoration of the right of sensuousness. Freedom would have to be sought in the liberation of sensuousness rather than reason, and in the limitation of the higher faculties in favor of the lower. In other words, the salvation of culture would involve abolition of the repressive controls that civilization has imposed on sensuousness. And this is indeed the idea behind the aesthetic education. It aims at basing morality on a sensuous ground. The laws of reason must be reconciled with the interest of, se of the senses. The domineering form impulse must be restrained. Sensuousness must triumphantly maintain its province and resist the violence which spirit would vain inflict upon it by its encroaching activity. To be sure, if freedom is to become the governing principle of civilization, not only reason but also the sensuous impulse requires a restraining transformation. The additional release of sensuous energy must conform with the universal order of freedom. However, whatever order would have to be imposed upon the sensuous impulse must itself be an operation of freedom. The free individual himself must bring about the harmony between individual and universal gratification. In a truly free civilization, 
All laws are self-given by the individuals. To give freedom by freedom is the universal law of the aesthetic state, and a truly free civilization, the will of the whole, fulfills itself only through the nature of the individual. Order is freedom only if it is founded on and sustained by the free gratification of the individuals. By the fatal enemy of lasting gratification is time, the inner finiteness, the brevity of all conditions. The idea of integral human liberation therefore necessarily contains the vision of the struggle against time. We have seen that the Orphic and narcissistic images symbolize the rebellion against passing, the desperate effort to arrest the flow of time, the conservative nature of the pleasure principle. If the aesthetic state is really to be the state of freedom, then it must ultimately defeat the destructive course of time. Only this is the token of a non-repressive civilization. Thus, Schiller attributes to the liberating play impulse the function of abolishing time and time, of reconciling being and becoming, change and identity. In this task culminates the progress of mankind to a higher form of culture. The idealistic and aesthetic sublimations which prevail in Schiller's work do not vitiate its radical implications. Jung recognized these implications and was duly frightened by them. He warned that the rule of the play impulse would bring about a release of repression which would entail a depreciation of the hitherto highest values, a catastrophe of culture, in a word, barbarism. Schiller himself was apparently less inclined than Jung to identify repressive culture with culture as such. He seemed to be willing to accept the risk of catastrophe for the former and a debasement of its values if this would lead to a higher culture. He was fully aware that, in its first free manifestations, the play impulse will be hardly recognized for the sensuous impulse will incessantly interpose with its wild desire. However, he thought that such barbarian outbreaks would be left behind as the new culture developed, and that only a leap could lead from the old to the new one. He did not concern himself with the catastrophic changes in the social structure that this leap would involve. They lay beyond the limits of idealistic philosophy. But the direction of the change toward a non-repressive order is clearly indicated in his, in his aesthetic conception. If we reassemble its main elements, we find 1. The transformation of toil, labor, into play, and of repressive productivity into display, a transformation that must be preceded by the conquest of want, scarcity, as the determining factor of civilization. 2. The self-sublimation of sensuousness, of the sensuous impulse, and the desublimation of reason, of the form impulse, in order to reconcile the two basic antagonistic impulses. 3. The conquest of time insofar as time is destructive of lasting gratification. These elements are practically identical with those of a reconciliation between pleasure principle and reality principle. We recall the constitutive role attributed to imagination, fantasy, in play and display. Imagination preserves the objectives of those mental processes which have remained free from the repressive reality principle in their aesthetic function. They can be incorporated into the conscious rationality of mature civilization. The play impulse stands for the common denominator of the two opposed mental processes and principles. Still another element links the aesthetic philosophy with the Orphic and narcissistic images, the view of a non-repressive order in which the subjective and objective world, man and nature, are harmonized. The Orphic symbols center on the singing God who lives to defeat death and who liberates nature so that the constrained and constraining matter releases the beautiful and playful forms of animate and inanimate things. No longer striving and no longer desiring for something still to be attained, they are free from fear and fetter and thus free per se. The contemplation of narcissists repels all other activity in the erotic surrender to beauty, inseparably uniting his own existence with nature. Similarly, the aesthetic philosophy conceives of non-repressive order in such a manner that nature in man and outside man becomes freely susceptible to laws, the laws of display and beauty. Non-repressive order is essentially an order of abundance. The necessary constraint is brought about by superfluity 
rather than need. Only an order of abundance is compatible with freedom. At this point, the idealistic and the materialistic critiques of culture meet. Both agree that non-repressive order becomes possible only at the highest maturity of civilization, when all basic needs can be satisfied. With a minimum expenditure of physical and mental energy and a minimum of time, rejecting the notion of freedom which pertains to the rule of performance principle, they reserve freedom for the new mode of existence that would emerge on the basis of universally gratified existence needs. The realm of freedom is envisioned as lying beyond the realm of necessity. Freedom is not within but outside the struggle for existence. Possession and procurement of the necessities of life are the prerequisite rather than the content of a free society. The realm of necessity of labor is one of unfreedom because the human existence in this realm is determined by objectives and functions that are not its own and that do not allow the free play of human faculties and desires. The optimum in this realm is therefore to be defined by standards of rationality rather than freedom, namely to organize production and distribution in such a manner that the least time is spent for making all necessities available to all members of society. Necessary labor is a system of essentially inhuman, mechanical, and routine activities. In such a system, individuality cannot be a value and end in itself. Reasonably, the system of societal labor would be organized rather with a view to saving time and space for the development of individuality outside the inevitably repressive work world. Play and display as principles of civilization imply not the transformation of labor, but its complete subordination to the freely evolving potentialities of man and nature. The ideas of play and display now reveal their full distance from the values of productiveness and performance. Play is unproductive and useless precisely because it cancels the repressive and exploitative traits of labor and leisure. It just plays with reality. But it also cancels their sublime traits, the higher values, the Desublimation of reason is just as essential a process in the emergence of a free culture as is the self-sublimation of sensuousness. In the established system of domination, the repressive structure of reason and the repressive organization of the sense faculties supplement and sustain each other. In Freud's terms, civilized morality is the morality of repressed instincts. Liberation of the latter implies debasement of the former. But this debasement of the higher values may take them back into the organic structure of the human existence from which they were separated, and the reunion may transform this structure itself. If the higher values lose their remoteness, their isolation from and against the lower faculties, the latter may become freely susceptible to culture. <laughs>